Go ahead. Good morning. Welcome to our service at Mighty Bible Church. Hope that you're doing well. I want to just share with you some verses from Psalm 136 this morning as we begin our service and just lifting up the Lord today in worship together as we sing and then as we look at the Word of God today. Psalm 136 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the God of gods, for His mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endures forever. To Him who alone does great wonders, for His mercy endures forever. And the chapter continues, you can read it together. But as we think about who we're coming to serve this morning, we're serving the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the God of Gods. And I hope that you know him this morning, and I hope that you are ready to to worship him and to hear what his word this morning, that we might obey him and we might live for him this week. Let's open this morning with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are the God of Gods. We thank you for your mercy, your unfailing love, which endures forever. So often we are unfaithful. So often we are distracted by the things of this world, and yet you remain faithful, and your love has been demonstrated to us on the cross, and each day you you show your mercies that are new every morning. And so we rejoice in our great God. And I pray this morning that as we listen, even as we listen through uh, the internet this morning, that our hearts would be lifted up to see the greatness of our God, and that a response would be that we truly would worship from our hearts, that our lives will be lived for your honor and your glory alone. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first song this morning that we'll be singing is Our Great God, reflecting on the great God that we serve every day. Let us think about the cross at the cross. 
with all our sin. We think of Christ's death on the cross uh, and all that He's done for us. Um, he gives us the power to live in Him and through Him and to do right. He gives us His grace when He died on the cross by, by loving us more than we could ever deserve. Actually, He should have hated us for our sin and yet He loved us and died for us. And then He gives us the power to live day by day by His grace. And we need to walk through Him and accept His grace to walk uh, the Christian walk, but um, grace that is greater than all our sin. Thank you. 
grace that is greater than all of our sin, all the suffering, or all the, the sinfulness, all of the, the failings that we've done. The grace of God is greater than, than all of that. And the response, as Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, is that we then would offer ourselves a, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable God, to God, which is our reasonable service. And so I pray that that really is our, our desire this morning, that we would live for God and do whatever He has for us. We're going to turn again this morning to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, and we're going to finish up this section of Paul's prayer. We've been looking at the last two weeks, and I hope that it's been a challenge for us. As we've looked at what Paul prays for, of all that Paul could pray for as he was in prison, as the people that he's writing to were suffering persecution, they're going through their own trials of life, Paul uh, prays that they would become more like Christ, that they would be spiritually mature as they go through these trials of life, that the result of it at the end of this, this, this section is that uh, Christ would be glorified through their lives. And this morning I want us to look again at this this section, just review as Paul prayed, uh, we saw in verse 9 of Paul's prayer, he says, Paul prayed for their a love to be abundant. He says, in this I pray that your love may abound more and more. And as we looked at that two weeks ago, we saw that every believer has the love of God in his heart. In Romans 5, it says, the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts, been poured into our hearts. We sang this morning of God's love for us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And so every true believer has that love for, for God, and then we have a love for others. We looked at 1 John 4, where it says, If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And yet we know that that love needs to continue to grow, our love for God and our love for others. And as we've looked at this passage, as Paul prays for this abundant love, he's praying that it would grow so that some things would happen. Our lives are lived for Christ out of a love for Christ. And as he, had, as he prayed for that, we saw last week that that love would motivate us to, to be excellent in our spiritual lives. He says that you may approve the things that are excellent. And the idea there of approving is to test and that our lives would be, would be testing the things that come our way each day. As we're investing our lives, we're investing our time, we're investing our talents, we're investing our resources into something every day. And Paul says, I pray that your love is growing in such a way that your, your choices would be things that are excellent. Not just the, the good things of this life, but things that are excellent. And then he, he, want, he prays for spiritual integrity. He says that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. And we looked at that word sincere. And we, we, we talked about how the pottery, sometimes uh, those that were dishonest would... As they made the pottery, there would be cracks, and they would fill in with some wax and cover it over to make it look beautiful. And yet, it would be held up to the sunlight, and the cracks would be revealed. And our lives, we're not, none of us are sinless, but as we're walking in the light, we looked at 1 John 1, that we're confessing that sin, and God's making us more like Christ. We're not hiding things. Just, it, they're revealed by the light. As we're walking in fellowship with Christ, we're confessing them, and God's changing us. And so we're people of integrity. In our personal lives, and then we saw also with others. He says, and to be blameless or without offense. And that is not causing others to sin. And in our choices, we have many freedoms in our Christian life. And yet, we are to live in a way that does not cause others to sin. And our love for God and our love for others will cause us to live in that integrity. We said, we saw at the end of last week that this time of real proving is not in front of people today, but it's in front of Christ till the day of Christ. And one day we will stand before him and we will give an account of how we've lived. I uh, was reminded of a song uh, that we've, we've sung before and the, just the course that says, is it going to burn? Speaking of that day when we stand before Christ, the things that we've done, I believe our works, it says in 1 Corinthians 3, are going to be tried by God. And it's going to be like, so as by fire, the things that are worthless, the wood, hay, and stubble, the things that are just for this life are going to be burned up. The things that are lived for Christ in eternity, the, the gold, silver, the precious stones are going to remain and be to God's glory. One writer based upon that, that passage says, is it going to burn? What you built in this life, is it going to burn? Will you lose it all when your work in this life is done? Will you lose it all? Will you enter the kingdom as one to whom the Lord will say, well done? Or will you cross over into his land 
head down low with an empty hand. Is it going to burn? What a challenge for us. As we uh, have had the last few weeks, the last month and a half or so, we've seen so many things. People's investments have just been wiped out. People's jobs have been lost. People have lost lives. And we've kind of refocused and said, wow, there are things that are more important than just the, the rat race that we've been running. May it cause us to look beyond that. May we have the spiritual discernment that Paul's praying for, that we would live for what's truly eternal. We're looking at, Lord willing, in the near future, things will start going back to some kind of a new normal. And I pray that this would be our prayer. That as we go back to, to maybe more busyness, more activities, that we would keep in mind and approve things that are excellent. That we might be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. This morning we're going to look at this last part of, of Paul's prayer for the Philippians and for us. And he says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ the praise and the glory of God. The Amplified Version says this. It says, May you abound in and be filled with the fruits of righteousness, of right standing with God and right doing, which come through Jesus Christ, the Anointed One, to the honor and praise of God, that His glory may be both manifested and recognized. And so this morning, as we can look at this, we're going to look at being fruitful for God's glory. Paul's prayer is that we, our lives would be filled with righteous fruit. That as people see us, they would, it would bring glory to our great God that we sang about this morning. Let's just pause for the prayer as we start this morning. Father, we thank you that we can come together. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the songs that we've sung and the great truths of as we've lifted up our voices in praise to our great God who has demonstrated that love and his grace that is greater than our sins. And Lord, I pray that truly our desire is... Lord, here am I. Whatever you have me to do this week, Lord, I'm yours. I'm, my life is a living sacrifice to be lived for you. So I pray that even now that our hearts and our minds would be open to be led by you, that you would teach us, that you would show us your desire for us to become more and more fruitful in our lives and righteous living, righteous thinking, that as people see us, they would see Christ and that he would be glorified. We ask these things in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus. Amen. So this morning again, we're looking at this fruitfulness, being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ. Paul prayed that, that again, that love would overflow. That love would, would fill us with, with faithfulness, that would integrity, with fruitfulness for God's glory. That phrase, being filled, has the idea of, of really overflowing, of being completely filled. If you uh, go to get your coffee or your favorite drink, you usually don't just fill it halfway. You want to fill it all the way to the top. And that's the idea here of being completely filled with righteousness, that our lives would be lived of righteousness overflowing because Christ is at work in us. Robert Leitner says this. He says this, this righteousness, the right standing before God resulted, results from being clothed in Christ's righteousness. And it ought to produce fruit for God. As we think about righteousness, we have no righteousness of our own. Our righteousness has been imputed by Christ. As we trusted in Christ, the Bible says that, that Abraham believed God and it was put into his account. It was accredited to him. Christ's righteousness. And this morning as we stand before God, we, we don't stand in our own righteousness. As we trust in Christ, we are righteous positionally before Christ, before God because of Christ. But then that righteousness that God has given us in Christ, Christ now lives in us, the Spirit lives in us, and, and Paul's prayer is that we would be filled with that righteousness, that now there would be a practical righteousness, that our lives would be transformed for God's glory. As we think about fruit, he said, Paul prays here, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Paul often talked about fruits. And I want us to look at three different fruits that he, he uses in different passages the first fruit that Paul desired in, in, in the lives of believers, in our lives, is the fruit of salvation, of souls. God chooses to use us, to share the gospel, and, and one of the fruits that come from that is that souls are saved. That was Paul's desire. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul says, Now I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that I often plan to come to you. Paul had told the Roman church, I want to come. And up to this point, he had not been able to visit them. 
And he wants them to know, I, I'm not lying to you. My desire is truly to, to come and to be with you. But Paul's desire was not to come and see all the great sights of Rome. Paul says, I want to come, and I wanted to come to you, but was hindered until now, that I might have some fruit among you also, just as, mo- as among the other Gentiles. Paul says, I want to come and I want to, to be among you that I can share the gospel, that the fruit of souls would, would, would come about in Rome, that more people would be saved. We don't have time. It's really not our focus this morning. But if you look in the following verses, Paul says, I'm a debtor to give the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed to give the gospel. Paul's focus here in this fruitfulness is he, he wants souls to be saved. And that's something that should be a desire of each of us. We cannot save anyone. There's, none of us are capable of saving. That's God's work. And yet we desire, and Paul desired that fruitfulness, that as we are living a godly life, as we're sharing the gospel, that others would come to know Christ. The second thing that Paul, in a broad sense, that Paul talks about in fruitfulness is he talks about spiritual attitudes. Spiritual attitudes. I don't know if you've really thought about this, some of us more than others maybe, but in Galatians 5 it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And that fruit of the Spirit is not... It's not actions primarily. Now the actions will come out of it, but it's, it's, it starts in the heart. It's heart attitude. It's spiritual attitudes. It says in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now love will be seen, but it starts in the heart. That motivation to do what's best for others. It's a dying to self, and, and a, it does manifest itself in giving. God so loved the world that He gave. God demonstrated His love that while we are sinners, Christ died for us. And so there will be an action to it, but it starts with an attitude of love. It's joy. Joy is, is not jumping around and that may come, but joy is that deep-seated, that, that assurance that even though everything around me is going wrong, Christ is still on the throne. And so I have that joy. It's peace. Very closely related to joy. That I may have lost something dear to me. And some of us have. In these last few weeks, we've lost things that are dear to us, and yet we can still have peace. It, we, there's some unsettlement. What is, you know, this virus is, is somewhat unknown, and, and what, will, what kind of damage can it do to our loved ones or, or to ourselves? And there can be some uncertainty, and yet he says, the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit produces in our lives this peace, this gentleness, this long-suffering. That knowing how God has treated me, I then am long-suffering with others. Rather than flying off the handle, and again, if you've lost a job, some of you, uh, I, we had the kids come through on Friday. It was hard. There were kids who came through and they were crying. They wanted to come back to school so badly. And some of the parents looked like they wanted to cry. And part of it is because they're not used to teaching the kids and the structure and everything's different. But there's uh, one of the things that I think... There's just that expectation of the parents for the kids to learn. And, and it's difficult. It's more challenging to do it by watching a video and then doing it without a teacher and some of that instruction. And so there's, there's this raising of the tension because there's an expectation. And oh, that we would have that long suffering. That we would see, oh, God has been so, so long suffering with me. He doesn't just lose it like so often we do when our expectations are not met. And so this spiritual attitude, and Paul says, this is the fruit I want to see in your lives. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Paul says, I pray that you would be filled, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. And so there's salvation. There's those spiritual attitudes. And then there's spiritual actions. Righteousness is lived out. It's right living. It's conforming to God's standard. And may we not forget, today we, so often people cry legalist, and, and there is legalism, but we have, because of what Christ has done for us, because we love Him, we will want to please Him. Our lives will be conforming to what is pleasing to Him, and we'll desire to stay away from what displeases Him. That's righteous actions. Paul speaks of that in 2 Corinthians 9.10. He says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower, God himself, he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. May he supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. 
In Colossians chapter 1, another, Paul, another of Paul's prayers. As he prays for the church of Colossae, just I want to take one, one phrase out of the long uh, prayer, and I'd love to, to go through that this morning again. But he says, Paul prays for the church of Colossae. He says, being fruitful in every good word. He says, I want your lives to be fruitful. I want you to be, to be in every good work that God is just work, is providing. And God is leading you into more and more good works. And so that's the substance of fruitfulness. I want us to see, secondly, the source of fruitfulness. What is the source of fruitfulness? How, do I, how will my life be filled with that? You might say, Pastor, I want. You know, I, I look at this past week and I haven't been as loving as I ought to. I haven't been as long-suffering. You know, I, I've had some, some times when I've just lost it with somebody. Or I haven't had that peace. I haven't had that joy. I want us to, to understand clearly this morning that the source of, of fruitfulness is given in this passage. Paul says, I want you to be filled with fruits of righteousness which are by Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. He says, they're through Jesus Christ. It's not by us saying, I'm going to try harder. It's so, so much a part of who we are. You know, if there's something that challenges us, we go, okay, I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to up my game. I'm going to try harder, and I'm going I'm to conquer this. But the fruitfulness that is to be produced in our lives, the spiritual fruitfulness, is through Jesus Christ. I want us to think about this. This morning, maybe you're listening this morning, and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ. I want to I wanna lovingly tell you, you cannot live a righteous life. You cannot please God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. It says, The carnal mind, or a person who has not trusted Christ, their heart, their mind is, is, is at enmity, it's at war against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. Let me just break it down real quick what he's saying. He's saying, The person who's not received Christ as their Savior, they're saying, I will do it. They're saying, I don't need a Savior. I can do it. And God says, I don't accept that. Religion says, do it. Do good works. And if you do enough, then God will have to accept it. The Bible says, Christ did it all. Bow your knee. Turn from your sin. Trust the Savior. And so Paul says here in Romans 8, he says, the carnal mind is at enmity against God. It cannot even please God. It doesn't want to please God. It's still saying, I will. From Satan, who... who spoke those words in heaven and then told Adam and Eve, you can do it. You can become gods. And then in verse 8 of Romans 8, it says, so then those who are in the flesh, those who have not trusted in Christ, cannot please God. You can't please God. Isaiah 64, 6 says, for we are all like unclean things, and our righteousness are like filthy rags. God says, as he looks down from heaven for someone who's not trusted in Christ, and they're saying, look, I do all these good works. I help people. I, I, I see people and I give them food. I go to my temple or I go to my mosque or I go to my church and I give tithes and I fast and I do all these things. God says, without faith in Christ, he says, those things to me are filthy rags. They're dirty. They're, they're unclean. I, can't, I, don't, I don't like them. All of your goodness. He says, we all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. You see, again, a person trying to provide righteousness, trying to please God in their own and say, God, here's my works. You accept it. God says, my son has done it all except him. There's, there's a great contrast between religion and between what the Bible says, how that we come to God, we come as beggars, it says in Matthew chapter 5. That we come as beggars and, and we come to God and we say, God, I can do nothing. And God says, my son has done it all. Trust my son. And when we do that, righteousness is provided. Romans chapter 3. And then we can look at, again, the whole passage. And I just want us to, to look at this quickly. In verse 20, right in the middle of a section where, where Paul's talking about those who, it's, he starts off, all have sinned. There's nothing that we can do. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who seeks after God. He kind of funnels it down. And he comes to verse 20 and he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, by keeping the law, by making yourself righteous, he says, No flesh will be justified in God's sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. This morning, friend, if you're trying to, to say, I'm, I'm doing this and this and this, I'm keeping the Ten Commandments, the Bible says that no flesh will be made declared righteous by keeping the law. 
He says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. If you've kept them all and you, you break one, James says that if you, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. The law continually says, you are guilty. You can't keep it all. And once you break one, you're guilty. And, and it says that we are all declared guilty. It says in verse 21, but God has established, has brought in a law, a, or a righteousness apart from the law through faith in Jesus Christ. This morning, the basis of our righteousness is Christ died for my sins. My sins have been taken away by Christ at the cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.20 There was an exchange. The day that we trusted in Christ, Christ's righteousness was placed into our accounts. Our sins, 2,000 years ago, were placed in Christ's account. There's a great exchange. Our righteousness is found in Christ. But now, today, there's a practical righteousness. We're to now live for Christ. We see that in John 15, a familiar passage. I don't think we always understand it. But in John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If I, if I brought in this morning, if I brought in a branch, we have a mango tree right outside the back of the church. If I brought in that branch and it had some blossoms on it and I brought it in and I said, okay, now this tree is going to bring forth fruit, you'd say, Pastor, you're crazy. It's not connected to the tree. It's not going to get the nutrients that it needs. It's not, those blossoms are just going to fall off. They're going to be dead. They cannot bring forth fruit. Why? Because it's not connected to the branch. But if it stays on there, and we get some rain, or it waters, and, and the sun's out, and the different things, we expect that in time, sometimes too long, the bird's good, but we would something else happens. But it, a natural, the natural thing that happens is that there will be fruitfulness that comes as a result of the growth of that tree. And that's what Paul's praying. And Jesus here in John 15 says, that fruitfulness, the righteousness that, that's going to be produced in your life is by abiding in Christ. If you're not spending time with Christ, if you're not spending time in the Word, if you're not spending time in prayer, not just as we gather together, but in your own personal life. Your life will not be fruitful. The righteousness that, that God wants to produce in your life is not going to be coming out. And Paul's prayer is that, that we would be filled with fruitfulness, the fruits of righteousness. Again, in John 15, let me read the verses. In verses 4 and 5, and again, we could read uh, all these verses, but I just want to highlight a few. In verse 4, Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. The illustration I just gave you, that branch, if it's not connected to the tree, it cannot bear fruit. And Jesus says, in the same way, neither can you unless you abide in me, in Jesus. In verse 5, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruits. And then in case we forget, he says, for without me you can do nothing. You can't be fruitful. Our lives cannot be righteous if we're not abiding in the Word of God, abiding in that relationship with Him. But as we do, our lives will be. It's not going to be instant. We wish it were. We wish everything about our lives would change, that we would always be loving and joyful and peaceful and gentle and all these things. But as we're abiding in Christ, those will be the fruits that are coming out in our lives. We will be transformed. That fruit will be a part of our growth. Drop down to verse 16 of John 15. Jesus speaking to specifically to his disciples. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Jesus says, I chose you. And then he says, there's a purpose of why I've chosen you. He says, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Listen, Christian, if your life this morning is not bearing fruit, you're not fulfilling the purpose for which Christ called you. He saved you that you would be fruitful that you would bear much fruit and that your fruit should remain. He says, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give you. That's another fruitfulness. When we are abiding in Christ, when we pray, our prayers are going to be answered because our prayers are going to be saying, God, make me fruitful. God, do these, this work in us. Many of us know the name Warren Wearsby. He has many uh, 
the commentaries, and a very wise man. He says this, too many Christians try to produce results in their own effort instead of abiding in Christ and allowing His life to produce fruit. So often we come to a sermon like this and we say, wow, I need change. I, I want to produce more fruits. And again, it's not by saying, I'm going to try harder. It's by abiding in Christ. As the Word of God abides in us, as we abide in the Word and abide in, in our, that relationship with Christ, as we're spending time in, His, in prayer, the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and it transforms us to be like the Son of God. Our lives become like Christ. They become fruitful in righteousness. That is God's plan. Ephesians 2.10, he says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, two or four good works. We're God's workmanship. He's made each one of us. He saved us. Four good works for that purpose that we would become more like Christ, that our righteousness would be seen. It says, which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared us to, to walk in righteousness. He, he made that His plan. He, he, we come just as we are, but God doesn't want us to stay as we are. He's transforming us to be more like Christ. We read uh, a few weeks ago in Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that He who has begun that good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's at work. He's producing that righteousness in our attitudes, in our actions, and bringing others to Christ. Philippians 2.13, For it is God who works in you both to do and to do of His, and to, to will and to do of His good pleasure. He puts that desire in us now. As we're spending time in the Word, we, we put off those things that we looked at in Ephesians 4, the, the lying and the stealing and, and the bitterness and those things. And now He's producing righteousness in us. Rather, we're speaking the truth. We're working to, to help meet the needs of others. We're loving and forgiving as Christ has loved us. That's the work that God's doing. As He gives us that desire, it's, he, it's His will, and then He gives us the power, the Spirit of God living inside us. We now become fruitful Christians. Ephesians 5, we looked at that in Sunday school the last couple of weeks. In verse 18 it says, And be not drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, controlled by the Spirit. When we're controlled by alcohol, a person becomes different, not good. When we're controlled by the Spirit, a person becomes righteous. The person who's normally selfish and, and, and maybe short-tempered and all these things, as the Spirit is controlling us, we now become joyful, peaceful, long-suffering, gentle. That's the work of God. In fact, let me just remind us this morning that if we're not allowing that to happen in our lives, that God has in His love, He chastens us. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11, it says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Again, he talks about chastening, and, and he describes even uh, as a child that often many of us experience chastening. Sometimes it was painful, very painful. And he says, your, your father, your physical father did that because he loved you and he wanted to, to, to help you to grow. And it says, now our heavenly father also chastens us. And when He chastens us, it does not feel, it's not joyful for the present, but painful. He says, nevertheless, afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. God says, I'm going to bring this chastening because I want you to be fruitful. I want you to live a righteous life. And when you're resisting that, and when you're, 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 you're just saying, no, I'm not going to do that, God says, I'm going to have to bring some chastening because whom I love, I chasten. And my purpose in chastening is that it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God trains us. He wants to produce that fruit of righteousness in us. And so that's what Paul prayed, that we would be completely filled with that righteousness. The last thing that Paul prays here, really you could say it's a result, but it's a part of how we're to live. It's glorifying God. As we're abounding in love, as we're then making these choices of, of, of spiritual excellence, as our lives are becoming sincere or, or we're becoming people of integrity, looking to that day of Christ, and then as we see we're being filled with the fruits of righteousness, the result is that God is glorified. God does all things for His glory. 
And He wants us to be fruitful for His glory. He wants our lives to be transformed so that people would see Christ is in us. That truly Christ is powerful and He's changing us. In Ephesians chapter 1, we see that God has chosen us. We, we see the spiritual riches. And again, we're not going to look through all of them. But three times in Ephesians 1, Paul says, To the praise of His glory. In verses 4 through 6, I'm, uh, I was going to just read verse 6, but uh, just to give you a little bit of the background of what he's talking about. He says in verse 4, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined or chosen us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted in the Beloved. In verse 12, it says that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. And then in verse 14, it says, Who is the guarantee, the Holy Spirit, the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. I shared this many times. This passage, he's saying that we're to be trophies of God's grace. Trophies of God's grace. Our lives, our, our righteous lives, our, our, our lives of integrity, our lives of abounding love are to be trophies of God's grace. Uh, we went back last summer to the house that I grew up in most of my life. And we went down into the basement and no one's really been down there for many years. My brother's actually cleaned out a bunch of stuff a few years ago when my dad uh, went into an assisted living. And as I went down in the basement, I went into my old room there were trophies there that I laugh at it now because there were trophies for soccer and there were trophies for basketball. And they're kind of worthless now. But it, to, when you have a trophy, people think, wow, you used to play. And maybe you were even good at such and such. You're good at basketball. You're good at soccer. You're good at bowling, whatever. And the trophy is there to, to demonstrate that. Here Paul says, Christ saved us that we might be trophies of His grace. That people would look at us and they would say, wow, look at your life. Look at that love that you display. Look at your, your selflessness. Look at your, your devotion to God. Look at, look at how you're living a life that for, that's of eternal value. And often, people who've known us for a long time, they say, wow, look at the difference. What happened? The grace of God. God is that work. Is that what people see when they see us? Paul says, I'm praying all this that the end result would be that God would be glorified through your life. That people would see and not see you, but they would see Christ. That it would be to the praise and the glory of God. Jesus says in John 15, 8, in that passage we looked at earlier, the fruitfulness. Is, he says, abide in me. He says, by this my Father is glorifying that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. He says, my Father is glorified by your fruitfulness. <laughs> we can think of that also in a garden. When you go to, there's some people who have amazing gardens and you, you walk through the yard and you see all the fruitfulness and you say, wow, how do you do this? And they have a part in it. Ultimately, God brings the fruit even in that. But we see that uh, as, you, as you plant the tree, as you care for it, as you water it, as you, as you put the nutrients there, the, glory, the, the fruit comes out. And here, Paul says, Jesus says rather in John 15, he says, My Father is glorified by your fruitfulness, by your bearing much fruit. That word glorify means to magnify, means to extol, it means to praise. We can't make God bigger. He is glory, all glorious. And yet our lives live for Him. Help people who can't see. We can't see God in, in the sense that He's invisible. But they see the glory of God in a, in a small sense by a transformed life, by fruitfulness. People see the, the power of God as He changes our lives. John MacArthur, in wrapping this section up, he says, And so the love of God poured in our hearts, abounding in insightful knowledge of His Word, causes us to pursue excellence with spiritual integrity, which generates a life of power through Christ that produces good works, which redound to God's glory as a redeeming, transforming God worthy of eternal praise.
Oh, that's what we desire. Our desire is to bring God glory. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 16, Let your life light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Our world is dark. We see so much uh, just selfishness and and we're, we're burdened by the darkness of even in our American society, even here in Hawaii, the sin that abounds. But what should shine in that dark place is that there are Christians who love God and their lives are being lived righteously. And people can see that joy and that peace that we have. And the result would be that they would see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. That was Paul's prayer. Paul didn't say, Lord, take away all their problems. Lord, give them all the wealth. Give them all a, a great family and great retirement and all those things. Paul says, my desire is that your love would abound more and more. That that love would then would, would flow out into approving things that are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. That our lives would, would be growing more and more like Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness to the praise and the glory of God. That's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for my, for myself, for our families. I pray that you would pray that for each of us. That we would live for Christ's glory alone. That's right. Father, we thank you this morning for the clarity of your word. Lord, I pray that you would make us fruitful. That our lives would be filled with righteousness. That Christ would be glorified. That we would see that people around us would see Christ in us, in our homes, in our workplace, in our community, that Christ would be glorified as He's seen in our righteous living, in our integrity, in our love that's abounding more and more. Lord, only You can produce this fruit in us, but help us to walk in Your Spirit. Help us, Lord, to be obedient and allow You to, to change us, to make us more like Christ, that He would be glorified through us. We ask these things again in the precious name of Jesus.